Good afternoon, my young fellow travelers on the journey of life. I really am no one special, and I feel sort of somewhat burdened uh, by the uh, introduction. We're all sadhakas on the journey of life. We carry forward from our previous lives and who we are. Sometimes what seem like empirical, measurable achievements, little qualifications that get tagged to our names. But ultimately, it is who we are as human beings that counts. And as far as who I am as a human being is an eternal work in progress. When I met my sort of root guru, uh, the Dalai Lama, uh, some, you know, I meet him often some years ago, and I said, look, I have been a student of, you know, of yours for 35 years, but nothing is happening. Uh, you know, I do the practice, I read the, the scriptures I'm told to read, and he said, what's the hurry? It takes eons of lifetimes. And we are living in an age of instant gratification. Not just in terms of the instant gratification of our material needs, but of being happy, or of acquiring the material goods we need, or being able to wanting to access weekend courses to enlightenment. So the point of this wonderful initiative and in, in the umbrella of a great uh, spiritual being, Amma, is really to set us on the path of the spiritual quest. So we are all sadhakas. We may be of a different age, we may have different qualifications, different material you know, achievements that we can label, but what unites us all is that we are all on the journey of life, trying to become better human beings. And the great trap of trying to be happy. Now, those of you who feel you're happy being here today, will you raise your hands, please? Wonderful. Every single hand is up. How many of you feel happy all the time? Will you raise your hands? Very few. And, I, I, and, and we have to sort of, how do I put it? I envy all of you. And how many people feel happy some of the time? All hands get raised. And that's very interesting when we talk about happiness. Because we're not really sure of what we mean by happiness. Because, for example, if I say to you that, uh, um, do you know what sugar tastes like? All of you will say yes, we know what sugar will taste like, sweet. So you and I, so when I say something is sweet, we know we're talking about the same thing. Now if I were to take that analogy further and say, do you know what Coca-Cola tastes like? Now if you haven't tasted Coca-Cola, there's no way that I can communicate to you what Coca-Cola tastes like. And I think the challenge with the idea of happiness, or the concept of happiness, is that it's purely subjective. We saw from the raise of hands that it's not universal. Not everybody feels happy all the time. And even when we do feel happy, or we think we are feeling happy, are we talking about the same thing? I was, you know, driving here with two wonderful young men, and we were talking about Amma. And I was talking about happiness. And I said, does Amma feel happy all the time? I said, yes, of course. I said, how can she? When we see the pain and suffering of others, how could we feel happy? Whatever that notion of happiness is. So obviously, we need to revisit our understanding and appreciation, not just of happiness, but what we seek. And when we reach that destination, that is perhaps the label that we can give to it as being happiness. And I think that the, the whole idea of happiness has been transplanted in our consciousness uh, with, the, with the, the thrust in the United States Constitution 
which made the aspiration to happiness one of the goals of the American Constitution for its people. And that happiness began to manifest itself purely in material terms. So today we have countries like Bhutan and some, you know, Qatar in the Middle East trying to look at and measure gross national happiness. Again, using purely material, empirical terms of reference. Uh, to say that so-and-so is happy when he has a house or his self-perception that I am happy. Now, whatever that sensation that we ascribe to happiness, I think the first recognition is that whatever we today, you, I, consider and experience as happiness is transitory. It's impermanent. So, for example, we know in our relationship, say, a new cell phone. We ought to you know, stay up to date with cell phones because we want the latest cell phone, even though we will use only a fraction of the features of the cell phone. So when we get that new cell phone, we feel happy. Why do we feel happy? Because our sense of the self is redirected to that object, the cell phone. And I don't know about you, but you know, when I get my new cell phone and it gets its first scratch, I regret whether I had put a, a screen protector or not. If not, I want to put one, but the scratch is already in the glass and I'm stuck with it, with the scratch underneath the screen protector. Or if the case has got shut, I'll initially take, if it's a black, fan, uh, black phone and I prefer black phone, I'll take a little pen, felt pen and try and uh, cover the crack up so that it can still give me the happiness and the satisfaction that object does. After a while, it's now ready to be discarded because it's grown old and battered. It serves all my purposes, but it's now redundant because I need a new object uh, that will give me happiness. So in, 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 in the philosophical tradition and the spiritual traditions, no matter whether you look at, you know, I was, I was deeply blessed to have my first sort of stirrings of, uh, uh, how do I put it, uh, stepping on the spiritual path uh, through Swamiji, Swami Raghunathananda, the Ramakrishna mission, and then His Holiness, may and continue to remain uh, inspired uh, by the great work that people like Amma and even non-spiritual people like you know, Baba Amte or Mother Teresa uh, do, uh, and, and to learn from them. And ultimately the aspiration is what? is that we begin to understand the true nature of reality. So if that cell phone is impermanent, and we know, we realize this is impermanent, so when we get that cell phone, if we are aware that in one year, two years, it's going to get a scratch, it's going to be redundant, that diminishes our attachment or the gratification it gives us. So one of the first principles and the aspiration of, um, for, uh, you know, aspiration of happiness uh, is to recognize that the true nature of everything is impermanent, that it's changing. So, you know, when we are born, from the, from the day we are born, we are changing and we are moving towards death. We all know that material objects that we own or possess or seek so desperately to have will change and there will come a time either we don't have them or we don't have the capacity to enjoy them. Now the minute we begin to reflect on this, simultaneous to the fact that I as a human being and all of you, you may be young, I may be four times, five times your age, but we are all in this constant state of change. Now we are looking for gratification from objects that are also in a process of change or from relationships of people who are also in a process of change. So you have two, you know, two sort of things that are in constant process of change and we somehow want to grasp and hold onto it for the illusion of happiness, whatever happiness is. is. I dare not describe it, it's too complex. But I can only point to states of mind that will enable us to experience whether you want to say quietude, 
when you want to say I feel centered, non-grasping, each tradition will offer us a different vocabulary uh, for what uh, uh, happiness might be. Because happiness is a non-conceptual subjective experience. We cannot know what the other person experiences, the actual sensation, sensibility, sense of awareness. That will create whatever uh, happiness is, independent of what the economic system that we grow in expects of us, or we live in. Today, our economic system structures of economic activity and development are constantly working to nurture a need, whether we have it or not. So whereas your cell phone could serve you for five years, you will have an advertising blitz to persuade you that it needs to be changed. So that you then grasp at something that is changing. And that in, 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 in many Western societies includes relationships. It includes your partner or your spouse. They too have become changed. It's no longer that, you know, a, a, a couple who are deeply in love walk into the sunset and live ever after. Because we don't know what will happen when it sunrise. So it is that consciousness bringing to awareness of the true nature of reality. I think the second sort of defining uh, realization uh, that's, that's extremely valuable to, to, to nurture this is the idea of interdependence. That we are all living in an interdependent world. If I'm standing here and have the great blessing and the privilege in Amma's community to be speaking to a group of young people, this has been made possible by so many people. By Amma above all, by all of you being here. Someone gave, gave me put a, put a microphone around my neck, the person who made the microphone, the person who put the microphone, when I woke up in the morning, I had a wonderful breakfast, someone cooked the breakfast, someone cooked the oats, someone grew the oats. So we just pause to think as to how many people make the, just our very human existence possible. You will find it's infinite. If you also believe in reincarnation, and certainly all the traditions that I uh, subscribe to believe in reincarnation, though in different, uh, in, 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 in different ways, it also means that everybody in this room, at some point, as we go back into infinity, will have been my brother, my sister, my mother, my father, whatever it is. So, just because we are in a new lifetime, or if I lost my a parent, uh, you know, some you know, five years ago, it doesn't mean I stop having that deep feeling of affection. So, when we begin to plant these seeds in our consciousness, we also begin to realize that not only is everything changing, but that we are dependent, interdependent on each other for our very survival, for our very happiness. And that leads to a very, uh, you know, a, a critical uh, a point. And I think that you are here under the umbrella uh, of Amma, and, and it's extremely crucial. And that is, you know, Swamiji, who spoke before me, talked about seva, talked about service. Now, we need to understand that this is not just an abstract moral concept. We do not just need to serve other people because it's a good thing to do, or we will earn merit in our karma. It is also the most practical thing to do. And why is it practical? We are in an interdependent world. So if someone is happy and they smile, we feel good. But now we learn from modern sort of scientific psychological uh, testing, uh, and I think it's very important that all traditions remain open to all forms of knowledge that emerge. So when I talk about scientific data, I'm not saying that because scientific data validates something, we should accept it. So just like science has its limitations, so does the spiritual quest have limitations. There have been perhaps more wars fought to protect our particular religious perspective 
than for territory or, or, or commerce to recently, recently sort of uh, a recent development in some ways. So that, so now science is pointing out to us, psychological testing says, that when they, when they talk to people and Western psychiatrists interview people who are suffering from depression, who have identity issues, who have issues of relationship, there is an obsession with the I, me, mine. So they tend to use those phrases excessively. And that's the predominance of their, con of their conversation. It's all about I, me, mine. Now what does Seva do? What do the traditions of religious practice do? They soften that obsession with the self. So when Amma is doing Seva, of course, it is reaching out and it is impacting other people. But for those of us who have the privilege of engaging with the Seva, she suggests, or the Ramakrishna mission, or whichever tradition you subscribe to, that very principle of doing things for other people takes away our obsession with our self. And if you really think about the moments of happiness that you have, it is when you are able to s surrender the sense of self, either to the cell phone, or to the object of your love, or your affection. For that minute, the self that suffers has been displaced. The challenge, of course, it, is that when that is over, bang, it comes back. And hence my connection, you know, the idea of uh, sadhana and, and, you know, instead of saying effort or education, is the great principle of our civilizational heritage has been sadhana. Now, you know, you are already people who are committed to some degree, in varying degrees, to sadhana and, and the spiritual journey. But can you imagine how little, how difficult it is for us to find time Whatever our sadhana or practice may be, it may derive from Amma, it may derive from anybody. Uh, that how little time we find for our sadhanas that enable us to train our minds to be happy in inverted commas. Uh, but the amount of time we spend, we spend learning our professions, our skills, beautifying ourselves, whether it is beauty parlors, our ego, grooming ourselves. But when it comes to training the mind, that doesn't have a priority. And yet it is training the mind that is at the core of our ability to find equanimity, sukha, bliss, whatever. I'm not going to get into the semantics of it. So we have to train our mind. And what is the aspiration of training the mind? Soften the self. That is the core teaching of Amma. No matter how you approach it. And the recognition that certitude is the greatest obstacle to personal growth, to human evolution. My way or the highway. My teacher's way or the highway. But the great teachers, I was just sharing this with my friend Dr. Balakrishnan, that when Amma sits there and these people come to her and she hugs them and whispers, them, whispers to them in their ears, she's not interested whether he's a Muslim, whether he's a Christian, what caste he belongs to, who he is, for her, it is the unconditional giving. And I also shared with Amma last night, I said, you know, Amma, I think the you know, people who use the English language have been very misleading, and they talk about Amma's love. I prefer Amma's compassion, because in today's vocabulary, love has become reciprocity. Love has a connotation of attachment. I think what I'm saying is far more than, uh, you know, uh, a spread love, She's spreading compassion. So it's extremely important that we don't fall into the rhetoric that as young people, as students, everything we practice must stand up to the scrutiny of the heart and the scrutiny of reason and logic. If it doesn't, it will not endure. If you just follow the heart, when things go wrong, you will not have the st structural framework of the mind to understand it. And at some time, it'll crack. Because we as human beings have been given heart, emotion, sensibility, and we've been given a mind. And this is not just something that's divine. This is the process of evolutionary biology. 
Today, this is what we as human beings have. And the remarkable thing of uh, great people like Amma is that it stands up analysis and scrutiny of both. And that is why it must and it will endure. I want to give you a, a, a brief example because we are living in trouble and fractured times when there's conflict, there's intolerance, there's conflict between religions. You know, we're struggling what should happen, Sabrimala, whether you should have a temple in Ayodhya and, you know, what we should do on, 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 on issues of, of people with other traditions and other beliefs and practices. I am an inheritor of the tradition of the Ramakrishna mission. That's my primary. Uh, and then from that uh, uh, whole structure uh, was built. Not widely known because people don't want to report it. What did Sri Ramakrishna do? Sri Ramakrishna was a lower caste pujari in the temple created by, I didn't know if it was possible, but a lower caste Rani, Rashmani. He goes into this temple as an avatar of Ramakrishna and in full public, in the public sphere, he engages in the diverse practices first of Hinduism itself. So Bhairavi comes in and, he, and, and, and Totapuri comes in, a whole range of teachers. And he does Dwight, Advait, he even does Tantrayana. So here's a man who's already an Aftar, regarded as such, incarnation of God, whatever, you know, however you may perceive God on earth. And what is he doing? He is engaging A in sadhana. He's not already saying to you, hey, you know, I'm an Aftar, I have a right. I have to make no effort. I have to do nothing. I am already enlightened and I will now spread the message. He engages in that sadhana in public view because he sends out a message of diversity. A, that you need to do sadhana, you need to do a sadhana that is appropriate for you, not what is some abstract message. He doesn't stop there. He goes out from the temple precincts, not to compromise it, and builds a little cottage on the precincts of the temple and engages in the practice of Islam. And when I was writing the biography, you know, I, I gave it to the, the then Swamiji, the president of the Ramakrishna Mission. He went through it. He said, perfect. Could you just delete the word that he ate beef and say he ate the diet of a Muslim, but he ate beef. And then he did it with Christianity. He did it with Sikhism. So he, in public display, what message was he sending out? He was sending out the message that each one of us, like we need a different physical diet, need different kinds of food. We, each one of us, needs a different mental diet. But the unifying principle of all those diets is a softening of the self. We can say ego, we can say Atman, I mean, th this is semantics. And then it was uh, Swami Vivekananda went on, and my interest from the Ramakrishna mission into Buddhism was, that here was the preeminent disciple of a bhakta who said, the Buddha, agnostic, is my ishta and Ramakrishna is my master. So the principle here is that we each have to find our own mental diets. And the mental diet you're getting here, Andharma, is a brilliant one. We need to appreciate it, we need to practice it, practice, practice, practice. So Vivekananda then came along, and you should read uh, Swamiji uh, in some ways more than uh, even Thakur, but you know, this, this is the essential message of uh, Thakur. Uh, and, you know, in, in Bengal, I grew up in Bengal, we call Ramakrishna, uh, Sri Ramakrishna Thakur. So, so Swami Vivekananda comes along and he goes to the World Parliament of Religions, and he wants to make this, this complex philosophy, diverse and vast, accessible. So like with the Greek myths and legends, he creates four archetypes. And the archetypes are, you know, Karma Yogi, Raj Yogi, Jnana Yogi, Bhakti Yogi. But archetypes are not isolated principles, so we all have different dimensions of these archetypes. And they become the archetypical mental diets. So, Dr. Balakrishnan teaches the Gita, philosophy of action. 
So what happens? What is action? Why do you, you know? Why do you perform selfless action? Selfless. What happens when you do bhakti? You surrender to the divine. You give up the self. So in each practice, it is a softening of the self that suffers. And so we have to reassure ourselves that a moral framework, an ethical framework, is merely a framework. Without sadhana, without effort. Now, on, on, on the battlefield of the Gita, uh, in which the Gita was articulated by Lord Krishna, Lord Krishna speaks to Arjuna and gives him the teaching. Arjuna is uh, transformed, but that message comes from Krishna. So we have the advantage here in Amma's presence, the Dalai Lama's presence, the, Swami, the great Swamis, of the, the great uh, teachers of India, that in their presence, that process of understanding and insight is accelerated. I cannot but em uh, emphasize enough the, uh, the importance of sadhana, because you, you know, I speak to you, maybe you think I'm talking rubbish, some of you may think it makes some sense, and then you forget about it. So unless, and this is the heritage, our Indian civilization heritage that we talk about, unless we engage in the practice, the actual practice uh, of the techniques that uh, we have inherited, and, and that, you know, I'm, I'm moving back because the mic loses uh, connectivity. So that enables us to turn intellectual understanding. I'm only talking to you, it's words, and sharing my experience as a sadhaka. I am not always happy. I suffer. I experience the pain of separation and loss. I'm just another human being like you are. So all I can share is my journey. When I look back at 40 years, the Dalai Lama says to me, it'll take eons of lifetimes, but I've seen a little, a little, a little change, a little more sense of, uh, equanimity, comfort uh, with myself, and less uh, anguish. So you can listen to Amartya Doomsday, you can be impacted, I always say, that you know, the impact that great teachers like the Dalai Lama, like Amma make, is more by who they are than what they do. So not all of them are great visible human beings. You know, sometimes it's somebody who's working in your house, it can be your mother, I mean, you can have remarkable human beings who have moved beyond the obsession with the self. So it's extremely important to recognize the significance of different mental diets, because what that also does is it makes for a more harmonious world. It enables us to see that when I say my reality, that there is no single reality. Today we learn from quantum physics that the very presence of the observer, you must note, the very presence of the observer impacts the nature of reality. So it would be extremely stupid and limiting for us to say that my understanding of my reality is absolute and must be shared by everybody. And which is why the great teachers, you know, Amma has shared a platform with the Dalai Lama, with the Ramakrishna mission, the Dalai Lama has been to a mosque and said the namaz, Sri Ramakrishna did, no less an avatar. So there is no conceivable reason, logic or emotional underpinning for us to be able to limit ourselves to uh, any particular uh, belief and hold on to it so tightly as our own. And the greatest obstacle uh, to uh, spiritual growth is the certitude of our intellectual positions because they circumscribe the potential of our spirit and of our heart. So it really is about expanding this. Now I'm just going to you know, suggest that if I can, uh, you know, for a few moments, just lead you through, uh, you know, we are working at our foundation and we hope to establish a partnership uh, with uh, Amma's institution, with other institutions, to look at some of these, it's, it's not great rocket science, it's not something very unique, is to look at ways in which we can look at specific practices that will enable people, regardless of their faith, particular faiths, so like you can go to the Dalai Lama and you can sit with him and you can be anybody, and be 
better at your own tradition. This is what Amma does for you. Without asking you to adopt the entirety of a philosophical framework. Learn from her. Let's learn from each other. So the imperative of the, of the mental diet, and just a word because it's, it's very widely used now, uh, meditation. We're all talking about meditation. So when I, uh, when I talk about mental diet, what do I mean? Just to take it a little further. So uh, let me give you the way we understand it. And that is that it is our thoughts, what we think rather than our actions, that determine the imprint on our consciousness. What is karma? The karma, karma is the imprint of our consciousness, on our consciousness, of our thoughts. So, for example, I studied moral science in a Christian mystery school. This is not a commentary on, on, on Christianity, but this is an example that you should be good. You shouldn't tell a lie. Gandhiji said the means are more important than the ends, etc., etc. So I'm just saying that this is an approach, and the approach that it is thought that generates uh, imprints on our consciousness, which then determines whether we are happy or miserable or how we feel about our lives. So tomorrow there is a riot, and a particular community is attacking another one. I don't want to take names, they're very emotive idea. And so community A is, is attacking uh, everybody in community B that's in sight. I take someone community B into my house. Community A comes and says, look, are you har harboring anyone from A? I said, no, I've told a lie. But in the context of the karmic imprint, the fact that I've had the courage to risk their wrath means that I have created a positive imprint on my mind. And it is a desirable act. The reason I say this out is that there is no absolute. So certitude is extremely dangerous. There is no absolute. We have to keep examining, keep questioning. We may not ever arrive at clarity. That is given to enlightened soul like Dhamma and the Dalai Lama and, and, and Ramakrishna and you know, the, the great masters. But so long as we're engaging in the process, we remain alive to the possibility. Now we conduct a lot of, you know, uh, we feel that, uh, and this is the final point, and I'd really like to take some, you know, any questions uh, that, that, that you might have. And that is the reason why these techniques and the sadhanas are important is that we need to convert intellectual understanding to what we like to say, realization. So I may know, and the you know, cell phone is changing, it's transitory. Uh, but when that cell phone comes in, I yield to it, or I know that I shouldn't be angry, and you know, I, I, I know this, and people tell me what I should do. But how do I convert that understanding so that it becomes a reflexive response? And it's only through realization. Now, great teachers are able to, to a receptive uh, sadhaka, catalyze, nudge, that person into realization. But if we don't continue with the sadhana, we can lose the impact of that realization. So let me, let me lead you through a, a very simple uh, practice that comes uh, you know, from our tradition, and I'm sure it's not unique to it. So can I just ask all of you to sit on your chairs, feet flat, and uh, hands on your knees, or if you're more comfortable against your belly. I have a large one, uh, so it's more challenging for me. But whatever is comfortable. So if you could just uh, uh, you know, do that. And I should say to you that, just to give you an example, uh, you know, I, I recently was with, the, with BK Sayangar, who was my yoga teacher, and he was 80 years old and he died. And, and uh, the importance of asana and posture. But very simple, that you know, when we're feeling depressed, we're like this. When we're feeling happy or contented, we're like this. So our posture in which we practice whatever we practice is crucial. You know, it's not something that's mumbo-jumbo, right? So we do that. Then we, and I'll just tell you what it is and then I'll lead you through it, what the practice is. So uh, it's important in, in, in when you're using the breath that the out-breath should be longer than the in-breath. That's a very basic principle of uh, yoga. 
because that uh, has two functions. It slows down the metabolism and it gives you a sense of releasing any thoughts that are in your mind so that you can plant fresh ones. And I will, so I will just lead you through this and I will try and plant uh, you know, some, uh, some thoughts in your, in, in your mind. And, I, and I, I promise you they'll be wholesome ones. I'm not going to be a cult indoctrinating you into doing something wild and wicked as cults tend to do uh, when you leave these premises. So if you just sit quietly, stop shaking your leg because it demonstrates that, uh, you know, certain restless in the body. Become conscious of your body. That's the first stage. All right. So like do a scan. You know, you've seen, you know, how a scanning machines just scan from the top, you know, from the bottom of the feet to the top of the body. So just imagine a scanning machine is moving from the tips of your toes to the top of your head. Okay, we'll do it quite fast, so it doesn't take too much time. So the scanning machine starts at your feet. Moves up to your ankle, to your knees, to your waist, to your navel, to your chest, to your shoulders, to your jaw, slowly up to the top of your head. Now breathe in very slowly, whatever count you're comfortable with at your pace. So let's say six, but if you want to go to 10, that's up to you. And when you breathe out, just make sure that you're breathing out to a longer count that you're comfortable with. So let me try four and eight. So breathe in one, two, three, Four. Breathe out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Breathe in. One, two, three, four. Breathe out. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight. Now visualize Amma. Visualize a form, a physical form. And visualize and feel. The feeling is really important. Feel her hugging you. Listen to what she is whispering into your ear. Feel her warmth. She has a particular kind of fragrance a body smell, odor, fragrance, uh, there's no appropriate word. Just feel that. And hold it in your consciousness. Now just shift, um, just remember to hold on to that feeling and that emotion. Shift Amma from the image and replace it with someone neutral. You neither like no hate, just anyone, and hold that, and see if you can get, evoke that same feeling, hold that feeling, and associate it with someone neutral. Gradually, replace that with someone who has caused you hurt and caused you pain. So, you're really seeing the image of who's caused you hurt and pain, but you're feeling the emotion, the warmth, the touch, the sound of Amma's voice. Now, lose that person who has caused you anguish and pain and bring Amma back into the mind space and see the golden light from her filling up your body. So now you're the golden light of Amma and Amma's form merges into that golden light. And slowly breathe out as slow and long as you can. Black smoke all the negative energy 
and the pain that you feel. And open your eyes when you're done. Take your time. Thank you. So this was just a, a very brief example. I mean, if you're, uh, if you believe, you know, if, if the image that you associate with is Lord Krishna or Ram or Allah or Jesus Christ, that's really up to you. What you feel an affinity to. Now, what this does is that it is imprinting on your consciousness love. And what that imprint on the consciousness is doing is that for all the other imprints of your previous thoughts and actions, which are every day imprinting uh, elements in your consciousness, so this is in a sense antidoting it. And if you, it's just like, you know, you need to keep doing this if you want to build this muscle or to do, you know, forward bend if you want to lose my kind of pot belly. So everything requires some form of exercise. And the reason I suggest this is because this is a group of students. So you work a lot with your minds. So you have the capacity, the potential to work with structured processes of training the minds and thereby providing an alternative mental diet that will leave you with a greater sense of fulfillment, of satisfaction, or whatever else it is that is meant to give you happiness. This is not my technique. This is thousands of years of India's civilization, and there are numerous such techniques, and you have to find the one that works for you. This works for me, and so I thought that I would share it. And the only final three words that I would like to leave you with, and I think I've spoken for too long, is what Bhakti says to me whenever he sees me, even in passing. So like I met Amash, he was spent me years and we had a brief conversation. If I had met His Holiness in, in, for a brief minute, he'd just whisper into my ears, practice, practice, practice. You can read texts till doomsday, you can listen to people till doomsday, you can meet Amma a zillion times, but if you don't practice, it's not your worth you're being here as part of this conversation. Thank you very much. Om Namah Shivaya. Uh, I'm, I'm an economic student. I say that for a reason. Like for me, uh, the way of life or is like a transaction for me. I understand as a transaction. And for me, transaction happens with the self-interest. Anything that happens. And here I come and listen to the terms like seva, selfless, it really, I don't know, I can't di digest these facts where there is no self-interest which we try to attach to these terms like seva and self-interest. So today after listening to your talk, I thought uh, it is the happiness. Like uh, here also there is kind of, I don't know if we can call it a self-interest, but like a return we get. That is the happiness in doing the seva. So, like, am I right? Like, can you comment on this? I don't know that you're right, because I don't know what will work for you. I share my experience and a generalization. But what I will say that the, uh, my talk has failed, because the aspiration of the talk was to suggest that it is in your self-interest to be able to be altruistic, to be compassionate, and to do a sadhana. Because plainly, and I'm not talking about you personally, but plainly the transactional model of living our lives is failing completely. And sometimes people who are looking at causality, so that's what we're suggesting. So let me give you, let me give you an example since you're looking at, at economics, uh, is that research in uh, particularly the University of Wisconsin and several universities in the United States have demonstrated measurably, I mean it's always dubious, you know, measuring happiness and contentment, have demonstrated measurably that practice such as the one that I mentioned to you, practice on compassion, creates biochemical changes in the brain 
that show up in brain scans. So we know that the softening of the self is not merely an abstract because after all it is the biochemistry of the brain which is what keeps the imprints on our consciousness you know, in, in, in a physical level that it changes parts of the brain and not very different to a diet. So just assume you're ill with a mental problem and, and let me compare that with a stomach ulcer. So I have a stomach ulcer, I take medication, I change the acid levels in my body and it heals. So I have a mental problem, we now know that drugs work. I mean, how effective they are, how sustained they are on the brain, we don't know. But it works and people begin to feel better and if they, if they uh, you know, engage in collateral practices, they can move off drugs and it changes because if you're in an extreme condition. But we also know, like the ulcer, that if we go back to the poor diet that caused the ulcer in the first place, the ulcer will come back. So similarly in the brain, if somebody is deeply depressed or suicidal, you can even give chemicals that will change for a while the biochemistry of the brain so we feel differently. But if they don't change their mental diet, that condition will come back. And each person needs a different mental diet. Something causes me acidity, something else causes someone else acidity. We each respond differently to different foods. So it's very subjective. Of course it's subjective. But the brain scan is not subjective. So it's for you to find out and try and identify what is the mental diet that works for you. I was just uh, sharing with Dr. Balakrishnan that you know, I came back from England in a, in a, from university completely messed up. And so my teacher said to me, that look, you're in such chaos that you can't still or focus your mind. At that time, the Beatles were a pop group who were very, very popular. And they had come to Rishikesh, to Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's ashram to learn transcendental meditation. So he said, well, go and listen to the Beatles. Look at their spiritual journey. So you, you I mean, it, it, it is irrefutable evidence that changing the mental diet will make a difference. What your mental diet is, I'm not qualified. A great teacher may be able to tell you that this is the mental diet appropriate for you. But that causality is completely, uh, 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 how do I put it, uh, absolutely connected. It just depends on what level of acidity you have in the, in the, in the, in the stomach, or like the acidity that you have in your consciousness or your mind in your thoughts. So it's also good economics, because if you have a workforce who are, uh, you know, contented or talented, the problem arises, and which is why no management institution will want, will want me to come and, and give my perspective. Because if I say to a management, you know, a management institution or a management graduate goes into you know, working for uh, you know, Facebook or Google and say, look, it's really not important. You should not create needs that we do not have. The business will collapse. So it depends on what you want to do with your life, what kind of economics. Uh, you believe in what economic models you want to practice, but I would argue that if you went into this, as Gandhiji famous said, famously said, there's enough for our needs but not our greeds. So if you want to work in any economic environment or infrastructure where you're perpetuating greed, then I'm afraid yourself will never find peace. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, I have uh, heard about you from my father and I am seeing you today. It is one of the great pleasures. Oops. <laughs> and uh, I am not, that, uh, I'm not uh, saying that this is my question. Uh, my question for you is that uh, you are here only to tell about uh, concept of happiness. Okay. And uh, one famous quote in Hindi is there, Man Changa to Sab Changa. And uh, we find, we, uh, we have all our uh, fa uh, various moods that uh, we feel happy, we feel sad. So how can we get, get over those to find happiness? That is my question. My friend, it's very simple. You have to recognize, like I, that's why I gave you the example, that Amma experiences meter, she experiences a kind of equanimity, a 
kind of overriding, overarching sense of equipoise. Well, you know, we can call it, use all kinds of vocabulary. But that doesn't stop her from feeling the pain and the sadness of someone who is suffering. So we have to recognize, when I said that we need to recognize the true nature of reality, we need to recognize that we will feel pain. But what we can do is that we do not experience the pain of experiencing pain. The human condition, as the Buddha described, there is inherent. So, you know, I, I'll give you an example. You know, when my mother was dying, I was devastated. And my luck felt, you know, I fainted when they gave me a diagnosis of cancer. And so I went to, uh, you know, a, a guru, and I will not name them, who I was making a film on, and I said, you know, my mother is dying, and I'm, I'm distraught. So what that person did was, they did some, you know, gave, gave me some holy ash, and said, you know, give, the, give your mother this ash, and all will be well. I felt very good. And when I gave her the ash, I met the Dalai Lama, who for me is my real teacher. And he said, meditate on death. She's going to die, if not today, tomorrow. So you better learn, you better begin to deal with it before it happens. So that loss, that feeling of loss is inevitable. Then the Dalai Lama said to me, and I started crying. He said, that's not, I said, I'm sorry I'm crying. He said, why are you sorry? Because when I lost my teacher, I felt, sense, I felt the sense of loss. So that is what makes us human. If your aspiration is that I will feel no disappointment, no pain, no trauma, you're not a human being anymore. So it's a question of levels. So what Amma has is, she experiences the pain and the suffering, but it doesn't throw her off balance. It impels her to do more for people. So we have to recognize that this is the true nature of reality. We will feel loss. We will be disappointed when our cell phone cracks or whatever happens to it. But that it's okay. That's a part of the human condition. So you are expecting, by impacted, by modern advertising, where everybody is sort of, you know, happy and, you know, all you need to get a, you know, I hope this is not inappropriate, but, you know, you're young people, you have romance, you begin to think about the opposite sex, you should be if you're not, is what? You see an ad and it promises you that if you buy this particular motorcycle, you're going to get a beautiful woman sitting behind you. So what do you need to do? What is it telling you? Buy a motorcycle. And that will give you happiness, including finding the love of your life. So that is the conditioning in which, you know, the spiritual enterprise such as this is trying to antidote. You have to recognize you won't. It won't happen like that. And that bike will get scratched. And that woman will age. Now you can either both age gracefully and savor it, or you can regret, oh, you know, I've added this beautiful, or vice versa, this, you know, this handsome man on motorcycle. Sorry. Namashivaya. Thank you, sir. Namashivaya, I have a question here. It's this last one. Just read it. Where are you? I really oh, okay. Ask. I see you. It's okay. So this is something I really need to ask. I, 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 won't, uh, I don't promise I have the answer. And that, that's all right. Um, so basically, uh, I, I just have a view about uh, there is a pressure in this world um, throughout uh, some of these years that you have to be happy. There's a pressure on people to be happy, I believe. And um, somehow social media, YouTube, all these places are promoting that pressure for being happy. I mean, you're forced to be happy. You're forced, you feel forced to post selfies to look happy. You feel forced to look happy. And then there are people who are so in touch with their emotions that they, they cry, they openly cry and they do not have any inhibitions uh, letting out the negativity within them, within them. But then there's a whole lot of other people who turn them weak and negative. And it's like if you're not happy, if you're not smiling all the time, you're not strong. So what would you like to comment about that? Well, I think that what they're really asking you to, to look at is the externalities, that you have to look happy even when you're not. And that, of course, is a social pressure because appearances are the aspiration. It doesn't matter whether you're happy or not. So today's society does not give us the space
to grieve. Today, Western psychology tells you that if you're grieving for two weeks, you need to go and see a psychiatrist, and that is the protocol for an antidepressant. It took me years to get over the loss of my mother, in particular. And then subsequently, that was the first major loss in my family. And so, uh, I mean, how do we antidote societal pressures? Is that we come to sacred spaces such as these, which bring to awareness natural reality, and we practice, we practice, we practice. Anything I say will not add up to anything. And you, and I, I cannot say that this is what you should do, because what you need to do is different to what I need to do, because you are in a particular situation, I'm in a particular situation. Teachers and friends and, you know, the, the Sangha, uh, you know, the, the spiritual community can help you find now you're already in such an amazing uh, starting block. So you have to use it and fine tune it and tweak, tweak it. And you're absolutely right. You're only illustrating what I'm saying. So now not only do we have to, you know, if, you know people think that when we're walking down the road and we're wearing, you know, I don't know what, uh, uh, a lac worth of saris, but somehow we're looking more attractive. So people will say, what a wonderful sari. Well, we want to say like, Amma, or the Dalai Lama, what amazing human beings. Now it depends on what you want to hear. Do you want to hear that? Oh, you know, it's... And then you can draw the distinction between a person who's really smiling from the bottom of their heart and their soul, and who's just, you know, spreading their teeth. So I have no... Please, I don't have all the answers. I'm a Shivaya, sir. Yes. Sir, I have a doubt, sir. Oh, I have many. So, share our doubts. <laughs> so, yeah, you have to say about happiness. So, uh, if you are doing things which is giving happiness to your society, but not happiness to your own parents, own family, whether I have to continue that happiness giving to the society or I have to stop? See, this is a very, uh, it's, it's, it's a very iconic historical question. Because, uh, you know, this is what the Buddha, of whom I'm, you know, I, I, I follow that heritage. Uh, the Buddha had to uh, confront this. So as you know, if you study life of the Buddha, that the Buddha lived in the luxury of the palace, and he could have been king, and he could have done so much good to so many people as king. So he stepped out of the palace, he went into the forest. Today, of course, people are coming in from the forest to the palace. This is what most, many god men are doing. But here was a man who moved from the palace to the forest in search of precisely this answer, that how, what causes human suffering and what is the way out of human suffering. Now people would argue that he caused great pain to his wife, to his son, to his father, and wrecked the kingdom. And I often ask myself that what if he had gone out and not found any truth, or not found great wisdom? So the response to that is what I mentioned earlier. What was his motivation? So there is a difference between sustaining responsibility to your parents and to your family simultaneously so they do not become the entire center of your being. So as they're aging, of course, it is your responsibility to be looking after them and taking care of them. But if that becomes an obsession to the exclusion of a larger social purpose, then I would say it's, Im it's, it's imbalanced. And then finally it is your motivation. That are you going out there to help people so that you are helped or you are going out there to truly help them? If you are, then that is the final uh, yardstick. Sure. <laughs> Whom we have to give most priority, sir? Our family or the society? It depends on your motivation. You know, how much energy you are willing to devote, what is the pureness of your motivation, and it is, everything is a balance. You know, you will have people, you know, who are so obsessed with their children that they spoil them. So it is a question of balance. What are your parents' needs? That is, again, evolutionary biology. You have to you know, look after your parents. 
But if you become so obsessed with your parents that you're not looking at anything else, then you're missing out on an opportunity for your own growth and actually you're not helping them. Because if by helping other people, you experience you know, greater satisfaction and equipoise, by seeing you happy, they'll be happy. So Ganeshji, may it sort of remove the obstacles in all our strivings. And I just sort of dedicated this uh, uh, to all of you. Uh, may the manifestation of the energy of this image uh, help and support all our practice, practice, practice.